Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 190 for Monday, November 19th, 2018. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig the podcast that is by, for, and about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Good, man. You sound uh, delightfully exuberant this morning. How are you, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, you know, sometimes you just find an energy level and you ride the wave, man. It's just how good. it goes. Yeah. Well, there's some good news in the world. The Stones are going back out on tour. Well, how about that? That's <laughs> fascinating. Gosh. That's your word? Fascinating? Uh, well, you know, I've seen the Stones a lot. They are my father's absolute favorite band. And so I grew up, obviously, with a lot of Stones. I certainly like them. I've played them. They have, you know, I have, I have created my own relationship with the stones that is, you know, separate from that, which I inherited from my father. But, um, I, you know, it's just amazing that these guys, like how old is, is Mick's not quite 80, right? But he's, he's getting there, right? That's pretty crazy. If you just think about that, just on the surface. Yeah. 80, 80. Y yeah. Grants in the stage at 80. He's not, he's 75. Okay. Well, there you go. 75. 75. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How old's Charlie? Oh, is Charlie the oldest one now? I think so. Okay. Uh, it was Wyman, right? It was Wyman, but yeah, Charlie's 77. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, in a way, Wyman, it's Wyman's 82. Awesome cool. You're right. Yeah, Wyman's 82. I've seen, I've seen the stone three times in my life, four times in my life, and okay. um, always fun, you know, always good. Um. But, you know, this is one of the problems with, with these uh, legacy bands is that, you know, the anthemic stuff still works and, and anything new that they've tried to put out always gets compared to the anthemic stuff. And, and uh, you get different crowd energies from those things. Yes. And uh, I don't know. I don't feel any I, I don't feel any deep need to see the stones. Actually, the last time I saw McCartney was um, was just OK. The first time I saw McCartney was freaking awesome and fantastic. But huh. um yeah, McCartney but, uh, can can run hot or cold these days, from what I understand. I, I the last time I saw him, he was awesome, and and that would drive me to go see him again. Yeah. The Stones, I, I think that's where my my fascinating response came from was that I I don't know that I feel a need to go see them again. The, the last time I saw him, they they did this interesting thing with tickets. They and they played arenas, not stadiums. And I, from our pre-show conversation, I know that at least most of the places they're playing for for this next tour are stadiums. But yeah. Um, yeah, they played the Boston Garden, and they did this interesting thing. Like all the seats in the lower bowl area and on the floor were six hundred bucks and up, like face value of the tickets, which was crazy. Yeah. And so I, I said to you know my dad's like, are you going to get tickets? I'm like, not at six hundred bucks a pop. Like no. But if you want me to get you tickets, like, you know, I'll happily go online and order them for them or whatever. And I, and then we looked and if you signed up on the stones mailing list, you didn't even have to pay to join the fan club. You could buy tickets for, I think it was 75 bucks. It was less than a hundred. Right. And you were wait, wait, a, close into the event. Well, or, or it, that's the, yeah, no, it was, you could just buy tickets. Right. But you were essentially buying remnant seating. So whatever tickets they couldn't sell or hadn't sold by night of the show, you just show up with your voucher, essentially. And it was a voucher you bought from the Stones. Like, it, was, it wasn't it was some shady deal. Yeah. Yeah. You buy this voucher from the Stones, you show up, and you, you give them your vouchers. They guarantee that, you know, it'll be pair, they'll be, they'll, tickets will be in pairs, and they will be arranged all over the the uh, the arena. So some people will be like right on the floor way up front. Some people will be up in the rafters and everywhere else, you know, in between too. Right. And rafter seats were 150 bucks for this tour. So it was like, okay. So for 75, I've got a decent chance of, of being in a, a regular spot to see the stones and it's only 75 bucks a ticket. So we bought six tickets, three pairs. And uh, they split us up into two groups. They gave us four and two. So my dad and his wife were one group and, and the four of us, Lisa, me and the two kids were another. And we were both, we were, it was interesting. We were almost directly across the arena from one another, about halfway back from the, the, uh, from the stage 
maybe not even quite halfway back from the stage, uh, uh, you know, in the lower bowl, maybe 10 rows up. I mean, it, like I couldn't possibly have picked better seats, right? That's cool. Yeah, it was great. So for 75 bucks a ticket, but the people behind us had paid 600. <laughs> no, right. and they told us, but, but it was interesting. They're like, oh yeah, we flew out here from California for this show. And it's like, okay, well, when you factor in airfare and hotel and travel expenses, that 600 bucks a ticket suddenly becomes worth it to spend because to you don't know. Yeah. Because to know that you're not like taking three days off from work or whatever it is and spending all this money to travel just to sit in the rafters. Like you want decent yeah. seats. So I, like, I get that. And, and I liked that. I thought that was actually pretty good. Uh, but the show was really good and seeing the stones in an arena, especially with the way they, they had like a tongue shaped um, uh, catwalk kind of thing, you know, where they walked out on, and so there were moments of the show where, where Mick or Keith were, you know, right in front of us. And so it's like, yeah, like I, I know it, chances are it won't be that good again. So do I really need to go? Well, that's the thing. I feel, I, I don't feel any great need to go see the stones again. I mean, I love yeah, the stones. Right? I love the music. I love playing the music. I love listening to the music, but I, you know, I, I've seen Mick, you know, do his thing across the stage. And it's funny. I, yeah. I would still go see Bruce every time he comes. I mean, it, sure, the show is different, different every you. night. Right. Well, it is. The, the show is different every night. I mean, there's still last tour. He was still, he did a one, four hour show, man. I yeah. mean, he's, there's still like, yeah. you know, I'm pretty sure. But also, the stone but also is, Bruce is like, Bruce is your guy, right? That's My guess true. is you would go see Bruce, even if he was playing the same set, set list every night, you'd go see him if so. he came around. No, not if it was the same set list. Like, like, it was, it's never been the same set list. So there's no reality to compare that against. Sure. Of but, course. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, even when he was doing the full albums, like he did the whole tour, that was the celebration of the river album. He would play that album all the way through, but then the mm. rest of the show changed quite a bit every night. Was whatever he wanted. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, you're right though. I mean, I learned something and feel something different every time I see that. So, you know, if that's what the stones do for you, I guess I should right. knock that. No, I, I went and saw, there was, I mean, one rush tour, I think where I saw him six times and that particular tour, they were literally playing exactly the same set list. They didn't even have like three set lists that they were rotating between or anything like that. It was just, you know, the same, it was a show yeah. every night. Yeah. And, but I still went to see him. I mean, I was like 18 or something and you know, it was like, that was my favorite band at the time or certainly one of them. It was like, yeah, of course I'm going to go see him. Great. You know? So, but that actually brings us to a topic you wanted to discuss. And, and oh, yeah, that is good, good segue. That is the idea that, um, that for your band and for, and I'm, I'm talking to our listeners, but also for our bands, is it smart to have, is it smart to try and be clever with the set list or is it better to put together a show that your band hones and rehearses and polishes and plays? And yeah. So, so there you go. yeah. Um, this story for me starts a couple months ago where we had a, a ticketed show. This is, we were talking that I, I cut this deal with this winery for us to come out and do a ticketed show. Yep. And so I put all of our A-list stuff. We have, our band has, well, Russ, our new drummer has been with us a year now and he's learned a hundred songs over the past year. Um, our book is north of 200 songs. Um, so we have, you know, some pretty deep stuff, some stuff, Russ couldn't just jump in on or anybody couldn't just jump in on. So, you know, we've been playing from a pool of about a hundred songs sure. of the, the, of that pool of a hundred songs, you know, I'd say 65 to 70 are pretty can't miss stuff. And the other ones are subject to where they're placed in the set lists or, or the mood of the night, or if yep. it's a slow start to the night, you know, you know, something like peg, you know, which we enjoy playing kind of mid tempo. -y, you know, we use it as in the beginning of a night when not many people, yeah, the that, energy isn't quite peg, there yet. Peg is, uh, I feel like certainly it is a well-known tune, but I really would put that in the category for most bands as a vanity tune for the musicians to enjoy. playing. Uh, well, uh, that is certainly one of the places where it started, you know, it's like, yeah. Oh, we, you know, and actually I, like I've shared, I'm not a huge Steely Dan fan. I kind of think all of Steely Dan's well, I, catalog I don't, is, is I don't vanity disagree with that. They're all vanity tunes for the band. Right. Yeah. But I like them. So. Like it's, it's okay. But yeah. Although I will say there's a band around here and I, I forget their name. Oh, it's so clever too. But anyway, there's a, a, a Steely Dan cover band, you know, a tribute band around yeah. here. Packs the house every night, but yep. it's because pe the, some people really do want to hear that music. I, yeah. Yes. Yep. 
So anyway, there you go. So we have this uh, big show. I know it's going to be, we sold it out and I knew it was going to be a great crowd. And so I just said, we're putting all of our A-list high energy stuff from downbeat to the end. We're going to put on a rock and roll show and, and we're just going to leave it all out there. Yeah. And it worked out great. I mean, as I was sharing before, Dave, even my wife noticed, God, that was a great set list. No filler at all. Yeah. Right. And I never think in terms of filler. And it was funny to me to hear my wife, you know, kind of reference that concept. Uh, and I took essentially that list and, you know, maybe moved a couple things around, but more or less kept that list for the next two months. Now, uh, and every show has killed. We, we've been on a great roll lately, you know, in terms of packing the house and just really, really from downbeat to encore, just crushing it. And it's been mostly the same set list. There's no guessing with the right. set list. Every song I know works. Yeah. And so now we're getting ready for 2019. And this is the time of year where we start thinking about what do we want to add next year? And I make my list and it's kind of funny in, in reflecting this, I go back over the list of things that I'm thinking of. And there's always stuff in there that you have to put in the category of vanity and those vanity songs of like, and there's different degrees am, of vanity too. Well, I mean, you no, know, there's vanity that are just technically difficult to play. There's vanity, like some meaningful song that's meaningful to you. There's, you know, there's, yes, there's all different things well, that go into making And there's a vanity, vanity that also happens to work well for the crowd, right? I mean, that's the best of both worlds, but there's different degrees of that. Like there's, you could pick some, like it's weird for us in fling, um, our bass player, Burke, years ago, brought in Fish's Sample in a Jar. Uh, I've always liked that song. You know, I'm a big Fish fan. I I would never have suggested it for a set list because it's like, well, who's going to know that song? Right. You know, it's, it's like there, there might. And every night there is. There's the one Fish fan that knows the song. Uh, but otherwise, <laughs> not not really. You know, the thing is, though, for that, for us, even though the crowd doesn't know it, they love it. As long as it's placed and we play it well. It like it kills every time. It's like, this is just so weird. So it, that's like a, a, a serendipitous thing. Right. But otherwise, vanity songs generally, in my opinion, are defined as such because while we find them enjoyable to play, they tend to fall a little flatter than you would you would prefer. So. And that's the thing, a little flat, a lot flat. Yeah, just that's just degrees. flat enough to derail your your set list momentum. Yep. And so that's kind of where I am now. I'm really, and it's not even an issue of whether I, I would want a fully rehearsed same show every time. Although right now my eyes are totally open to that. There is a, a good benefit. Like if you make something that works, you know, why not rinse and repeat and get the same result every night? If so that's they, what you're after. Yeah. We, with Uptown Celebration, that's uh, uh, with, with perhaps very minor variations. That is what we do. It's just like, here's the show. Let's just go play the show. It's fine. We know it. We don't play together often enough to like call audibles on the fly or certainly not in the middle of tune. I mean, we're, we're all seasoned enough that if somebody needs to, to do something, we can, but the best thing is to just do that. Now with fling, I have a different problem. Um, and this is, you know, Fling is a democracy uh, in terms of just the way we run the band. But as you and I have said on this show many, many times, uh, democracies don't work on stage. And so I, generally it's me that runs the set list. I write the set list. I run the set list during the show. And a couple of years ago, I started getting grief after the gigs. Like, hey, uh, you know, how come I didn't get to sing enough songs? Or, Ooh. right, how come I didn't get to... Uh, how can we play, you know, if we played six originals, one of them was, was the only one of them was mine and the others were uh. written by the other guys. It's like, okay, wait, like, so, you know, at first, like when this happens, it's not like we have a big come to Jesus moment. It's just, we have a conversation, you know, it comes up like, Hey, I, you know, I didn't really get to, how many do I, do I get to sing next time? It's like, okay. So I would, I would factor that in, you know, and then somebody else would have a comment and I would factor that in. And the other night we played this gig. It was, it was great. We, it really went over well, but the same kind of thing happened afterwards. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. We just played a great set. We put together our own event, had another band play. I, I've actually got some, some technical stuff to go through that we'll, we'll address in a moment, but really the gig went really well. And, you know, after the gig, it was like, Hey, how come we didn't play enough of, you know, this kind of thing or that kind of thing. It's like, wait a minute. All right. Like, I get it. And I try to be sensitive. I'm not intentionally cutting anybody out, but you have to understand that my priority 
is to put on the best show that we can as a band for that crowd that's in front of us. Right. Sure. That is. And, and whatever is the second priority is way down the list. It is a distant second, the best show that we can do. And here's the reality. Like not everybody in the band is the best singer in the band. That's just not how it works in fling. Aaron, our keyboard player is the best singer in the band. Frankly, I wouldn't want to be in a band where I was the best singer because I'm not good enough to be the best singer in a band. I'm, a, I'm an okay singer. Like the songs that I can sing, like, you know, I think like the things that I can do, like we recently added burning for you to the set list. I'm not afraid to say that on a good night, I freaking kill that tune. Right. But it doesn't mean that I kill everything. I just, that song's perfect for my voice. But like, I would also be happy playing a gig where I don't sing any leads. And so it doesn't, it doesn't like factor into my head that like everybody feels like they need to have an equal part. It's just like, that guy's the best singer. So he's going to sing way more songs than the rest. And this guy's the second best singer and he's going to get the second most number of songs. Then we're going to pepper in a couple things to keep the variety going because realistically, none of us is Bono, you know? So uh, it it's a really tough thing balancing that um, when, when that particular door is opened. And I don't, I'm not sure where I was going with this, but I just needed to vent that out. Mr. King. No, I totally get it. Yeah. So, this concept of the best thing. So I think you have to, I think a good conversation is what the best thing constitutes. Cause yes, you know, some people sure. think the best thing is original stuff and some people think variety and some people think, you know, demonstrating their cleverness. Some people think some musicians would think that, that challenging me so I can extract some kind of unique performance out of myself is the best thing for the audience. And I'm not going to invalidate any of those types no, of things. I mean, I mean, depending, I, I, like there are, there are bands that prove each of those things to be true. Right. Like, you know, uh, I don't know what about the stones, but like rush using that example, they proved that playing the same show every night works really well. And it, you know, they, they built a huge career on that. Awesome. Fish, the Grateful Dead, Bruce Springsteen have proven that playing a different show every night and and it, certainly in the 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 case of, of Fish, I don't know how the Dead or the, the or Springsteen approach the set list, but Fish likes to get clever sometimes with their set list. And the audience is in on that joke. So they have proven exactly the opposite from what Rush proved. Right. But but really, they both proved the same thing. And that is they understand their audience. They cultivated a certain type of audience and they cater to and play to what that audience wants to hear. Now, they got to define that. Sure. But they aren't doing this blindly like they're intentionally going out to entertain. And I think that's where you need to start with your with, you know, everybody. I don't just mean you, Paul. I think, you know, in general, right. you Amen. need to start with your band and figure out. What kind of crowd do you have? Is that the crowd you want to have? And, you know, like cultivate the right type of audience for the thing that makes sense for you to do, not which might or might not be what you want to do. You sort of have to be self-aware enough. Like what's our band's strengths? What's our band's weaknesses? Are you in a band where you've got one guy that can't improvise? If so, then do not try that. Like that's just not going to succeed, you know? Right. I mean, it, like, you know, that's it. If you've got a guy but to bring that, this conversation around to yeah. the cover band, dance band genre, yeah. you know, I, I'm always interested when you tell stories about your band, you know, that you have a different latitude for going into some directions and you're like, listen, we're, we're some people just want to listen to good rock and we're going to pull out some interesting yeah. things. And, you know, so, and I think that that's the thing. Everybody thinks they're pulling out interesting things, but I'm just want to tell you that my experience over the last couple of months playing no doubt about it, hit dance stuff. All killer, no worked, filler has, has really, you know, I find a lot of, I don't, and I can't speak for everyone in my band. I know they're enjoying the crowds, I know that they're enjoying the money. I know that uh, I know that the shows have a great energy to them that that's we really feed off of. And I would say that on all levels, the shows have, have really clicked and it makes me wonder. And I go back around. So now I'm looking at what do I want to do in 2019? And I have a bunch of stuff. And. Uh, 
I'm whittling it down to say, nope, that's vanity. That's vanity. That's vanity. That's vanity. Why am I messing with a yeah, <laughs> why yeah, mess with success? Yeah, because that's what we do is we mess. With success. I know we overthink it. Look at it. we do a podcast every week where literally what we do is overthink everything. So exactly. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's interesting. We, we just booked a, a kind of a big fundraiser event for January, um, which I'm sure I'll talk about as we get there. Cause it's, it's, it's interesting booking a fundraiser at a place that actually wants to make money. And there's, there's a lot of weird little things going on, but we were talking about the set list, especially in light of, uh, you know, kind of the, the feedback that I got on uh, from Saturday night. And it was like, yeah, look, this place is going to be packed full of people. They're going to be there to party. We are playing the best set that we can put out there. And that's just how it's going to be. And, you know, that we will have fun with it. We won't find ourselves in these weird dead air moments where we've confused the crowd. Yeah. And each other. And each other. <laughs> yes, that too. Yes. So, as I said, the gig went went really well on Saturday. Fling played really well. We had a, a good stage sound, good energy, just, I mean, just a ton of fun. It's, like I said, it's this place up in, in Rollinsford, New Hampshire, which is about 20 minutes from us here. And it's, um, it's just a, a club that, that you can rent the room out and do whatever you want with it for the night. And one of the guys, Mike, our, our guitar player in fling, he, uh, he's a member there. So he gets like two nights a, a month or something. So we don't use nearly that many, but we've done a couple of events there and it's, it Saturdays went well. We brought in, uh, our, our friends in Sea rock to, to play the gig with us. There's a reason that I shouldn't have mentioned their name, but it's easy enough for you to figure it out. So <laughs> I, I'm just going to say it like we, we didn't hide who was there with us and they played really well. Like they, like they're a great band. They, they play a lot of what I would call musician vanity songs, but they, like, you know that when you're going to see them and, but they're great at it, you know, like, I mean, they'll play things like uh, Bodhisattva and reeling in the years and and comfortably numb and, uh, you know, Lido shuffle and highway star, things like that. And they just kill them. So songs that are not diff, not easy to play. Right. You know, that you got to think your way through them and that sort of thing. But they just kill them. Their singer Suzanne is great. Right. They got this new drummer. Awesome. Really nice player. Um, so uh, but they showed up and. They had uh, their keyboard player who doesn't sing a whole lot and their lead singer, this, this woman, Suzanne, uh, and I've played with C-Rock before. You, you've probably heard me mention them. I played with them, filled in with them for the gigs at Hampton Beach and all that stuff. And they show up with these vocal processing boxes. And it's like, why do you have that? Like, well, so like like pitch correction things? Well, yeah, it's, it's these, you know, they're, I, I, I have the model number here. It's a TC Helicon thing that they're, that they're using. And it's a uh, TC Helicon voice live play. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes and it can do all that. It can do, you know, uh, the, the uh, pitch correction. It can add chorus. It can add reverb. It can add all kinds of different effects. It can shape the sound of your voice. It can add compression. It, it does like all sorts of different things. And they also, I think that one can also be used as like a looper if you're doing an acoustic thing or, you know, whatever. And I've, our bass player. So, so there were three of these on stage because Burke and Fling also has one of these that he's been messing with. And I like, as the person in charge of the sound for the night, I, I was like, I hate these things, but uh, like, let's see what happens. And they, they, oh, they never sound good, right? Even when they're turned off, like you pass your mic through them or whatever, they just didn't sound. And it, I mean, Burke did it. He had his for sound check and I had to like re-EQ his whole thing just to get it to sound good. I'm like, okay, well now it's fine. So just leave it alone. And, uh, and, and then Suzanne set hers up and I had the same problem with it. And I'm, but I was actively mixing for them to try and get this right. And it was feeding back like crazy. And I realized it, I, I, and I'm, I, I don't know this for certain, but the, the, um, the result of what I saw when I was looking at like an EQ graph for her channel was anytime she sang, it was like this big block where every EQ, like every, um, you know, you look at a graphic EQ and, and I have a real time analyzer on it. So you can see which frequency is at what level. And it's like a 32 band thing or whatever. And from like 200 Hertz, to 4k was just this block where everything was always at the same level, basically. And I looked at somebody else singing into a mic that didn't have one of these processors and it had sort of a natural contour and curve to it. And I'm like, okay, so 
it looks like, and I'm, I'm assuming it does, that this thing has a multiband compressor in it. And I'm no stranger to multiband compressors. We're using one right now to make our voices sound great for the podcast, right? But it was just bringing the the level of every frequency up to the same, right? Like bringing everything up or bring, think bringing the peaks down to really like flatten the whole thing out. And of course, when you do that, you wind up getting feedback because you're bringing up these frequencies that aren't naturally there. And and so it's just, it was just a disaster. And I, I think, and you couldn't hear any of the effects that, that they were trying to use. Like they did crazy train, right. And she wanted that, yeah. you know, chorus sound. And I think if she could somehow get the box to just do the chorus sound without applying all this gain structure processing and e re EQing and all that, just you want chorus, add chorus, nothing else, leave it alone, do the EQ in the mixer. Like you're good. That might be okay, but that's not what was happening. And I, I think these things, I understand now, I believe the purpose that at least these people were trying to solve with these things. And I think they're going about it the wrong way. In fact, I think they have the wrong tool for the job because to them, it sounds better in the monitors. And it's because you're boosting all these other frequencies and hearing this stuff in kind of an unnatural way. And I think because it's going through this digital processor, it gives you a very, very slight delay, which helps immensely with hearing yourself in the monitor. Because if you're hearing yourself delayed from where you were singing, it, it doesn't have to be as loud to, you know, to, to make it into your head. I think every one of these people should return these vocal boxes and and just get in ear monitors and solve that uh, problem for themselves. Uh, really? I, because I, I think, actually have one of those. So well, but interesting. do you use it? I, I think I've used these things for acoustic gigs and they're That's great. It. They're yep. great. It's just with a live rock band, the effect that this allows you to have is lost in, in the mud. And in fact, smooths it out so much that you can't bring the vocals up above anything because it's just all mud. Yeah, I've never tried to use it in the band, but I got I got one of these as a gift. Yeah. And it's it is a fun toy. I, I I question a little bit about and the real thing is about the automatic harmonies that are in it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So but that's weird. That's that's so fake, right? Right. I mean it's right. just it's you know, effect is one thing, but you know, mm. adding another adding another vocal part is is just a weird thing. But um I've actually found that the the it has a great feature for compensating for under saddle acoustic pickups. And so there, there is some value to these things. And again, it is solo acoustic. It seems to work. I, and I'm seeing more and more people use them. It has a looper built in. So it's got a lot of features that it has, but um, I could see how it would do nothing but muddy things up for, for a full band situation. Either I'm not using it right. They're not using it right. Or it shouldn't be used. Like one of those things is true and, and possibly more than one. Right. But it was just a disaster and it really made their set difficult. In fact, I had to actively mix them all night. And when Fling went on stage, we just, you know, set it and forget it. Nobody even grabbed the mixer. It just sounded great all night. And I even heard a somebody put a video up of the last song we did, which we were a little too loud for, from my, you know, if you had asked me on stage, are you playing too loud? Yes. You know, and the mix was freaking perfect. And the vocals still were cutting out above it. It's like, you know, a halfway decent microphone into a mixer with, you know, the, the right EQ set is really, I mean, in most rooms, that's just what it's going to be. And if, you know, nothing's going to make you sound like a better singer than you are, but a right. lot of things are going to make you sound like a worse, worse. singer than you are. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So it's just frustrating. So, all right. Now uh, I, 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 so if anybody knows anything about how those stupid things work in a rock band setting, Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I, I seriously would love to learn more because it it appears as though I'm going to encounter them uh, on a <laughs> free, on a basis that is more frequent than I would desire. <laughs> so I get to the gig, right? And we decided to use Fling's backline. I, this is definitely a lesson in something you should not do. And I, my apologies to all involved, but, you know, no names changed to protect the, the innocent. Uh we get to the gig and we're using Fling's backline and which meant my drums, which was fine. You know, we'd sort of had that conversation. The drummer gets there. I, I guess he was not 
told that he, it was left unclear to him. The communication never made it through to him. So he walks in the room after we had set everything up and, and I'm like, Hey, are, you know, are you the drummer? Yeah. Okay. And we talked to him like, so, you know, I just, I start talking to him like, like he's, he knows the, what was previously discussed. I'm like, so the, the kids up there, you know, I've got a, a black beauty snare on there. There's a Eames perch snare in the bag over there. If you want to use either one of those, you're fine. Or if you brought your own, obviously that's also fine. Like whatever you want. And uh, he's like, oh, he's like, and can I use your drums? And I'm like, oh, of <coughs> course, absolutely. He's like, okay, cool. That, wow, that makes life easy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, th- I kind of thought that got communicated. He's like, yeah. And then he said, he's like, because I've got a, k- a set of Eames drums in the car. Eames is this um, uh, custom drum shop, small custom drum shop out of northern Massachusetts. And I said, well, funnily, funnily enough, the set that's on stage is an Eames set. And he was like, oh, pfft. Perfect. He's like, because I also have a black beauty in the car. I'm like, well, then you're good to go. You know, and so we sort of, you know, bonded over selecting the same sorts of drums for ourselves. Sure. Right. So I'm on stage doing uh, our sound check so that we can get off stage and they can do theirs. And he comes up and he's like, you should try my ride symbol. And he's already got this thing out of the bag and he's like handing it to me. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, no, really, put it up now. Like, yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't want to offend this guy. So, yeah, okay. And it looks like a nice, it's a big K custom. Great. Okay. He's like, you're going to love this thing. Like, yeah, okay. But we're sort of (laughs) running out of time. Didn't want to do this, but fine. So I open up my symbol case. I put my symbol in it. I put his on the thing. I put put my symbol case away so that it's not a big mess. And I, you know, I I played it for our sound check. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a really nice symbol. Cool. So they go up, they play their set, uh, they finish their set, and uh, and we had we had done the the shared backline so that we had a quick changeover. We did the quick changeover. Fling is playing our set. We're maybe twenty minutes from ending, and the drummer comes up and says, "Hey man, can I have my cymbal back now? I gotta leave." <sighs> yeah. So there's two problems with this. Number one is the obvious, you know, interrupting somebody on stage for a thing that, you know, was like he paved the path. But the other is if you're doing a gig with another band, you don't leave before that. Like, especially if they're hosting you, you do not leave before they're finished. They were there through your set. You stay there through theirs, especially like I could I could see it if he finished the gig or even before the gig and said, look, you know, I've got something else going on. I'm really sorry, but I can't stay, you know. uh, okay, fine. But this was like. It, there were 20 minutes left and he knew the end time or at least all of his bandmates did. Uh, you know, it wasn't like we were asking him to stay three extra hours. I don't know. And I'm sure he didn't think of it that way, but it definitely comes across as being uh, disrespectful to absolutely uh, to to not just be so, all so for just one and one for all. Yeah. In the essence of this, are you, are you just going to say he's just a clueless guy? Oh, I know, think he was, was clueless malice. about it. No, I don't think yeah. it was mal. I don't think it was spiteful. I, he was, he, he, like I said, he and I were like, we got along thick as thieves. I mean, it was all good, but it's just a lesson, man. You don't like, you just don't do that. Uh, right. It's just not cool. It, it, because it, it, it just sends the wrong message everywhere. You know, you, that band was there through your set. You stay through yeah. theirs. It's, it's just, it's how it, it's the code. It's the musician's code. The bro code. Yeah. It, well, it's not even the bro code. It's just the musician's code. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, sure. yeah, yeah. It was like, and I was like, I was having a good set and this guy comes up and asks me this. First of all, it's like, I, I'm actually kind of in the middle of a thing here right now, you know, but, uh, oh, sure. Let me do this for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Like the, just that, that part sort of proved the cluelessness to like, he definitely wasn't being, you know, malicious or anything, but it was like, God. dude, and it pissed dude. me off, you know, it's like, man, like, not good. Not cool. Not good. Did, no. it, did it throw you off? No, thankfully, no. I, I kind of wondered if it would in the moment. I'm like, wow, I'm really pissed about this right now. Like, <laughs> is this is this going to like what's going to happen for the rest of the set? But no, I, I sort of lost it. You know, I mean, not lost it. I, I forgot about it very, very quickly. Once I got into the next tune or whatever, it was like, OK, like I said, the band was playing well. We could hear really well. Everything was good. It was, you know, good. we were happy. Yeah. Yeah. So it it really didn't derail things other than, you know, the the three minutes where I, I was like, all right, well, somebody else on stage tell a story while well, I dismantle this and hand it back to him and go get my symbol case. And, you know, it wasn't like, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like this was a five second operation. It's like, oh, OK, well, I need another ride symbol. And you didn't happen to bring one with you from my symbol case. So let me go get that. No worries. I, I got it. All good. <laughs> let me make your life easier. Let me, yeah. Oh, heaven forbid you stay right. They just relax. I don't want you to stress about this at all. <laughs> 
I know it's a little people. dickish to ex- describe it this way, but it it's just not a thing you do. I don't know. And uh, is he likely listening to this? He might be. His bandmates probably are. It's all. Do, do, do his bandmates know what transacted? I would assume so. I mean, if they were watching what I mean, I didn't I didn't go out of my way to make a big deal that this was going on. But, you know, it did disrupt the show. (laughs) It would have been hard not to. So, you know, yeah, just not a thing you do. You know, it's funny in those moments, you really um, you have a few doors that you can walk through. One is your natural temptation to, you know, tear someone apart. One is also a natural inclination to I've got to focus on what I do. So I'm not going to let you derail me. I'm just going to kind of deal with you. Your journey. I mean, right. you actually, you kind of go through a mental checklist of, of which most of us, some people just act, some people just react. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I know I find myself like, all right, if I, if I dress someone down is given all the factors of what's going on, how easy or hard a load and it's been, how easy, how yeah. good or bad the sound is. Am I setting the stage? My band will, you know, just natural tendency is like, they'll be looking at me like, all right, if, is he going to be that guy tonight or, yeah. you know, what's going on? So you, I actually find myself and this is be more my personality. I rarely, but not never. I rarely will just react and allow whatever that emotion is. It, it's happened, of but course. often I kind of go through a mental checklist of the pros and cons, very quick mental checklist of the pros and cons of all the options of how to respond when someone's being a jerk. I had a guy. I, so here's a my, thing. my mental, I want to hear your story, but just so you know, my mental checklist was very short. It was, this is going to be a great story for gig gab. And that was enough, <laughs> but that, that was enough to get me past it. It was like, okay, here we go. Like, here's your freaking symbol. Go away. Like, this is going to be a good story. <laughs> so why we have, um, there's a guy who is a music fan in our area and to his, his, to praise him, he's a good music fan. He comes to a lot of things. He really needs to have a connection with all the musicians though. So he kind of hangs, you know, as much backstage sure. as he can. He doesn't quite have the filter to take the clue when the musicians have to go, you know, take care of business. He just wants to talk and talk and talk. And uh, I had an acoustic gig on Friday night and he was there and he <laughs> was sitting close to the proprietor of the place where I was in, and, and he was like, oh, yeah, Paul's great, but you should get you should bring in. Paul with so-and-so and so like, like basically pitching that the owner should, should not have me play solo. And I, you know, right there, I was at a poise and I was like, dude, what are you doing? Right. And I actually said, dude, why do you want to mess with my gig here? And, and he had, he's a guy with not a lot of self-reflection because mm. I would think he can tell because every single time there is um, a moment of discomfort where the musicians are trying to, pull away like you know yeah. whether it's me or someone else in my band or other bands that i've seen it happen with and he just doesn't seem to get that message you know yeah. it just it doesn't get it. so anyway i actually my first reaction to this i just played a gig it was a good gig fun everything like that and i have someone say hey um <laughs> yeah it, it would paul's good but it would be even better if this and i'm like dude what are you doing why do you want to tell her and i i had a smile on my face when i was doing it but inside i was you know you know kind of seared but i chose at that point in time like the gig is done yeah, I appreciate this guy coming to the gigs. It's a, that's a good thing. But now he's kind of messing with the gig. And so I think a good constructive conversation should happen. Direct, you know, like we say, sometimes direct, yeah. direct doesn't have to be contentious. No. Right? So direct can be direct. Yeah. For direct sin. And it is uh, a skilled thing. And especially well, but like you in that, that, I was going to say in that moment, especially with the owner or the manager, whatever she was right there, that might not be the right time for you to be direct with this guy. Right. <laughs> Just like it was not the right time for me to me to be direct with, you know, this drummer, because there's a, like it, you don't necessarily meet, need to be direct with an audience. And right. and in fact, that's often the worst time to be direct. Oh, because, pretty much always, unless you yeah. are char- unless you are consciously making a point that there's some value in this yes. public display of lunacy, right? Right, right. And yeah. you know, sometimes there is though. I mean, I actually think if you want to send the message out that you need you need a little bit of time, you know, doing what we do, even if it's though it's not heart surgery, you know, doing what we do is an investment of our personal 
uh, yeah. personal creativity, right? Yeah, we're wrapping right. some things up with it. It deserves some res- amount of respect. I mean, even though it's, it's again, we're not curing cancer here, but it does it does deserve a certain amount of respect. You, if you take yourself too seriously, yeah. you know, especially in a cover genre or something like that, and it, you know, if you're going to go looking for fights in order to kind of create your legend of being an emotional person, you get the you get the pluses and cons of that tact, right? Totally. Yeah, more cons than pluses, but um, but I do think that, and this is kind of what my reflection was. Uh, the owner was not there, so I, I I was clear-headed enough not to make this a very public thing, but I did address it with him right there and then, and hopefully the message got through. Sure. You know, don't mess with my gigs. Yeah, don't mess with my right. Yeah, it's, until I hire you as my manager, please. <laughs> yes, don't represent don't me. Yeah, yeah. So. that's a that's a hard that's a hard thing, right? Because you want. I, we're uh, a third party recommendation is uh, it can be not it's not a universal truth, but it can be more powerful than you saying, hey, you should book my thing. Like if that even if that's what you wanted to do, like his recommendation for it could be better than yours. Right. Because it's yeah. like, oh, this is, you know, external validation of a thing. Um, so you don't want to necessarily universally squash that. But at the same time, it's, you know, well, it's hard to manage what people are going to do when they just give, uh, you know, unsolicited feedback about you. So, yeah. yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. Welcome to the headache that is PR for every corporation out there. Right. You know, we want you to say things about us. But would you say them this way, <laughs> please? <good> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not only good things, exactly the way we want them. Yeah, said. You know, in fact, we've got some talking points for you. Would, 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 would this make your life easier? You know, that's pretty funny. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I did learn a lesson the other night, though. I, I, I don't want to finish this episode before sharing something that that I've been doing incorrectly, in my opinion. And uh, and I realized in Fling, we on stage and it's weird that we've had this disconnect on stage. We've always announced like if we play a Fling original, we'll credit the chief songwriter for that song. So, oh, this is one of Russ's originally is Mike wrote this or Aaron wrote whatever. Um, and and like I've always just done that because it feels right. Like I'm I'm really honored to be able to play in a band with these great songwriters and they truly are great songwriters and to be able to play these songs and and all of that. So it it's always just been from a a place of of goodness, right? Uh yeah. yeah. When we copyright our songs though, we we intentionally we had a long conversation about it and our uh, actually, all of our songwriters arrived at this conclusion before the two of us, Burke and I, who haven't contributed any songs to to Fling, uh, decided everything should be sent in with everybody's name on it. And the reason was, A, you know, we bring these things in, we do collaborate on them. The out, the out, You know, the final uh, arrangement of it is certainly the product of it going through all of us. But more importantly than that, it is that we don't want the credit for the songs to be something that drives the band apart. And it really was taking a, a nod from uh, both uh, REM and the band Sloan in Canada. They both chose to do this earlier in their careers and it's great, right? Cause it, it just like, it's just how it is. The songs are there. As long as everybody's good with it, everybody's good. And the other night I was announcing doing what we normally do or what I normally do. And so Russ wrote that one. It turned out that this set list I had put together wound up having a lot of Russ Miles songs. Now, Russ doesn't sing most things. So I sing some of his songs. Mike, our guitar player, sings some. And, uh, you know, so it, it's it's not so much, hey, that guy sang it and wrote it. It was like, that guy wrote it, even though he didn't sing it. And But I realized that I wound up putting mostly Russ's originals on the set, set list. And that made it, announcing that they were his, made it more awkward uh, at least in terms of some of the guys in the band, it was like, oh, uh, right. Cause I'm shining like over and over. You were yet, saying over and over a yet another Russ song, yet another Russ song. It's like, oh, we don't have any Mike songs on the list. Even though Mike sang a couple of Russes, you know, it's fine. We just don't have any, mm, Uh oh, you know, and, and it, it hit me that we would 
actually, it would probably even be perceived by the crowd better if it was, hey, and here's another fling original. Here's another. That's it, right? It's a fling original. You don't need to know how the sausage was made. Or if you do, you could ask. But, you know, just here's a fling original. It doesn't matter. Yeah. In fact, it's best not to divide up the band and and show it that way. It's just we are one. And here's here's our song. And that's another song of ours. How interesting. Yeah. And I never so, thought of it so before I actually, until that. Yeah. I actually have a lot of questions about this. This is a good place for us to pause for it because I actually would like to next episode. Yeah. I want to talk a lot about that that transition, that gray area, that that uh, pearly gate you walk through when when you marry cover projects with original projects. And ah, I know that there's a whole yeah. lot of models. Yeah. And again, remember, I I am very much distant to that process, but really interested in that process lately. I've been thinking a lot more about original material for the first time in my life. And so, um, yeah, I want to, I want to pick your brain about this and get into it. So if it's cool, let's pause that let's, here. Let's wrap let's, it up. Let's make it. Yeah. And make like an agreement. It. Next episode is, you know, where the two worlds, the worlds collide. Worlds collide. <laughs> I, yeah. And I have, I have, um, always had the pleasure of playing in projects where there are originals and, and some degree of covers, and I've I've watched a band change from one to the other in both directions, and it can be disastrous or blissful. So yes, there's, I look forward to it. There's lots to chat about, folks. We will uh, we will do that next time, and that that means that this time is is over. Hey Dave, hold on, hold on. Yes. I just want to wish you a very, very happy Thanksgiving. I'm really grateful we get to do this thing together so often. I get to get to talk to my buddy every single week. I am so thankful for this, too. I'm thankful for all of you who are listening and participating and contributing and all that stuff. It's great. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Always, always be performing.